people on the phone, um, I, again, we encourage you to um, submit your question using your chat function. And um, when we were chatting about the workshop, we also said um, it's okay to ask questions during the presentation. Right? So um, actually, we would encourage that as long as they relate to what's being talked about. The workshop, so, um, and that's part of the fluidity. And the other part I forgot to mention, um, so we muted everybody on the phone, I said that already, but um, the point is um, we still want your opinion, so we're going to actually um, devise a survey. We thought um, it's going to help two or three key questions, so that we get your input on some key things moving forward. Just for a second, if, if you do have questions here in the room, if you just pause for a second so we can give you the microphone so that the people on the phone can have the benefit of hearing you. So we're going to um, proceed, and um, I'm turning the mic over to Rick Stump from NOAA. Um, and Rick is, I would say, the national lead on it's actually, all the three researchers from, from NOAA that are here today, they're, they're on the bleeding edge of this technology and, bring, um, and implementing it, developing it nationwide. So it's really exciting to have them here and have this training for us and be available to talk about it and discuss questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Karen, for the intro. It was a great start. Uh, before I get started, at least for the people in the room, uh, Shelly and Andrew, would you stand up so people can see? They're in the back. Where'd Shelly go? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, well, we'll connect, connect later. Um, what uh, we'll talk about this morning, um, uh, uh, Shelly just came back in the room, so um, um, there'll be three, do three talks on, on so three, there's three parts here. So now we stand when you see part one. So you know it's, we're not going to part 20. Um, the first we'll just be talking uh, about cyanobacteria, uh, at least uh, some of the issues Karen had already described, but a few things that pertain to uh, remote sensing um, point of view. The second part will be on the remote sensing um, so that you get the concept of what we're doing and how that works. And then third will be examples for California. So we'll try to go through that, um, and some are, we'll take a very short break, probably after this one, uh, just so people can get a drink of water or something else. So to get started, um, I think I've, I'm sure, all right, I got a pointer. We should be good here. So California, um, this is, a, by the way, Maricene for uh, California True Color, um, and uh, get a lot of clear days at certain times of the year. Quite remarkable. Um, uh, overall, our concerns with Karen had covered, but just there's toxins, taste and odor, um, problems clogging filters, sheer biomass is a problem uh, from a treatment point of view. Um, the um, various other pH, oxygen, and so forth. Um, of course, recreational issues, which also alluded to. Um, some areas it impacts property values if you have a the whole range of, of concerns. Um, there are risks, not to people, but also pets and animals. Many of you may know this, but um, uh, keep your dogs out of this kind of water. Um, there are, in fact, that happened in Humboldt County, apparently, just a, a year or two ago. Several dogs died as a result of sign and blow. Um, all over the, all over the uh, country, there are issues. Of course, we just heard about um, Melissa Miller's work on the, uh, the, the ones, the sea otters as well. Um, World Health Organization, uh, right now, back up, right now the U.S. does not have any standards for toxin levels. EPA is working on those. Um, the problem with Toledo last summer really brought that to the fore, and uh, EPA, U.S. EPA, is supposed to be releasing the draft documents, I believe, later this month. Um, so there will be recommendations for at least a microsystem. Um, and I think anatoxin also. The, the working um, level people have with WHO is um, alerts and um, the, the risks. Um, 
the moderate risk is where you get your concern, and that's 20 micrograms per liter for recreational exposure. Um, that's actually for adults. They say for children, 10 micrograms per liter of microcystin. Um, relatively low risk is two to four, and then extremely, what they call extremely high risk is gum formation. The, the graphic here on the right is for different species, and they have different, uh, the indication they do have different amounts of toxicity, and also the toxicity per biomass differs. Um, Plankothrix, for example, um, Plankothrix agarity has um, a relatively higher microcystin load from that conclusion as compared to uh, microcystis itself. So you can just see the relative bars on these. Um, the, the relationships between microcystin and cells and the chlorophyll, these are rules of thumb because all of these species, uh, if we just take microcystis, the um, toxicity varies over time, and that's not well understood at this point. It's um, the genes get switched on and off. You have more or less toxic strains. There's some indication that toxicity for microcystin may be driven by nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen availability. So early in a bloom, you might have more toxic um, blooms, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about this. Um, and I will say right now, remote sensing, we cannot see microcystin. No one can see microcystin from satellite or remote sensing. What we're doing is looking for the blooms. Um, we have some indication that there's fair stability for a few week period. So once you get a relationship between microcystin and the pigment, you can then make inferences on the distribution. So we are concentrating on the blooms themselves, but microcystin is one of the huge issues, similar to anatoxin and so forth. Um, but just to make it clear that we cannot, um, we, we cannot identify microcystin. Cannot be done from satellite. <clears throat> it's all sur what we call surrogates. And a surrogate is chlorophyll. A pigment is a surrogate. So you have that relationship and that holds. But these are some rules of thumb there. And this will show up. The 100,000 cells per mil moderate, that's, that's a indicator we use repeatedly in the satellite data. Um, Major groups of algae, there's a whole variety of things, the color of the water, um, and I won't go through all of these, but obviously the cyanos are one of them, but there are diatoms, the chlorophytes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just some basic um, ecology here, cyanobacteria. Well, we call them harmful algal blooms. That's technically a misnomer because they're bacteria, they're not algae, but it's a losing deal. You can't go between science and English very well. It just doesn't work. And and actually, it's kind of, to be hard on the science side, they talk about common names changing, but this, and with the genetics, the species keep change. We get genuses redefined and all that, so you can't even keep those straight. Um, but um, they are fundamentally different. There is no nucleus. The photosynthetic process is different in cyanobacteria. They are less prone to the chlor their chlorophyll will fluoresce in, in eukaryotes because it's a photosynthesis. System one, photosystem two for the cyanos generally doesn't. And that has some bearing on the ability to pick out the species as well. Um, of course, the um, cyanobacteria have the phycoblin pigments. These are actually proteins. Phycocyanin and phycourethrin are very common ones. Phycocyanin is pretty much an indicator of the presence. Because these are proteins, though, they produce them as they need them and they degrade them when they don't. And so they are different than, like, the chlorophyll. Um, a chlorophyll or carotenoid pigment in that regard. So, and that has some bearing on, on the value of these. Of course, some have heterocysts to fix nitrogen. Uh, microcystis doesn't, anabena does, for example. Um, we have seen in Lake Erie in our work there, you finally exhaust the nitrogen and you end up with an anabena blow after you started with a microcystis blow. They have to look the same and they both float as well. Um, the balloons, many of these, uh, not all, but many can float to the surface. Um, some of the, the, I was about to say popular blooms in California, but popular is probably not the right. The least popular bloom, there we go. The least popular blooms in California are scum farmers. You have a thanazomenon, microcystis. I don't know, do you have anabena? Okay. And you all know Annie, Fanny, and Mike, right? Everybody, yes. Okay. And everybody on the phone, are you nodding? Okay. So that's, that's all. So it's, so you've got, you've got all three. Microcystis is very prominent, but I, Phanazomenon, I should think, shows up in the climate quite a bit. Um, and yes, those are scum formers. Some others that aren't. Plankothrix is not, um, typically. And part 
of the scum forming has to do with formation of, of the more likely they are to create uh, clusters, colonies, the more likely they are. And it has to do with the vacuoles, but you're, the smaller this number is, the harder they are to rise. Um, that's some physics there. Um, typical conditions, of course, warm temperature, sunlight, nutrients, calm like. A cyanobacteria are optimized for those conditions. Diatoms are heavy, they sink. Greens are heavy, they sink. If the water is calm, the cyanide floats to the surface, and guess who blocks all the sunlight? So the diatoms have no light. That's the cyanos, and that's, that's the competitive advantage they have. Um, overall, the concerns, I said uh, Mike, Fanny, Annie, if they haven't come up with a Planktothrix or Cylindro, um, or, and Lingvia, I guess, shows up some. I think Clear Lake's had some Lingvia blooms as well. Um, and uh, as I say, some of these do are um, do form scums. A um, uh, few other details on these. You frequently get colonies of microcystis and the gas vacuoles. Uh, they can float up 10 to 20 meters per day, so it's not unusual to get that kind of migration with uh, with microcystis. The bigger the colonies, the faster they move. A panazomenon, very different in look, but the similar kind of uh, clumping colony sort of structure, and uh, with heterocysts, um, and uh, apparently, and um, a panazomenon sometimes produce a bit more on the um, on taste and odor issues, also. Um, Anabena, of course, different, much different shape. So, anyone who's anyone in the room looked at a scope bed? Do you have? By the way, has everyone here seen a scum? Okay. All right. That's why you're here, right? Um, uh, it's a uh, it's it's interesting. Yeah, if you get a chance with a scope to take a look um, through these, but you have some examples in, in these presentations for those. Um, Cylindrospermopsis. I don't know if that's made it out here. It's spread started in Florida, and it's up into the Midwest. Do you have Cylindrospermopsis out here? No, not yet. Let's hope the voters don't bring it here. Okay, and of course, Planktothrix is the last one, um, the different type. Yeah, link below. Um, just to show what they would look like, uh, like Planktothrix, this is a fairly dense bloom, but if it doesn't produce scum, it's floating through the water column. You have a very intense coloration, but it looks much different because you will not get that kind of formation um, of it. Um, but intense green. Um, these you've all seen. Uh, examples particularly from California and Aphanazomenon and Microcystis, um, kind of issues you can have. And we've seen the same sort of thing in yeast. And the colonies, I, you can't quite tell in here, but it actually looks, this case looks like sawdust in the water. You can see the little clumping. That's very characteristic. It's the water slightly choppy to get that kind of appearance. And the scums can look dramatically different. If they stay up on the surface long enough, they can start bleaching. Some of the pigments start breaking down. Um, and so you start getting, this looks more like you think this is ice, but it's in fact, this is in August, and I can tell you there's no ice. And even after a cold winter, there's still no ice up there in August. Um, but yes, that's uh, actually the scums that have stayed up for so long, they've actually bleached. Some of the, the process involved, key, the key nutrient, I think most of you know, phosphorus, um, is the driver. Most lakes are phosphorus limited. And cyanobacteria um, do well with um, high nutrients. The uh, cyanobacteria are not as anywhere near as fast growing as diatoms or greens. The doubling rate for a diatom or green algae, they can double several times a day. Cyanobacteria, microcystis, for example, it's, it takes anywhere from three to 10 days to, to double in population. So this is a slow process that develops. It's not a rapid development. What, what typically ends out with calm weather um, is you have the calm conditions, again, the diatoms settle out, and the cyanobacteria are slowly growing during that process, and that's how that works out. But, um, and of course, they can sit at the surface, and because they can move through the water column, uh, by, um, in this room, uh, anyone know how the, um, the flotation works? The gas vacuoles, um, they basically store carbohydrates and they get heavy and they sink. 
So as they photosynthesize, they produce carbohydrates. They're down at the bottom then, and they use that, and they start producing carbon dioxide. They fill a gas vacuum, they float up. Very clever system for something that's dumb bacteria, a billion years old. But that means it can go down, pick up nutrients, come back up to the light, and, and pro progressively migrate that way. There's some indication they may have, there's additional chemical controls on it, but that's just the simplest process, because there are cases where they just stay up near the surface. Um, overall with the phosphorus, um, this uh, downing's work, you could say the rule of thumb is if you have a phosphorus load of greater than 100 micrograms per liter, and I'd say the, the red here is kind of the average condition where you, you're likely to have cyanose. Once you're over 100 micrograms per liter of total phosphorus, you pretty much are going to have a cyano bloom in, in that water body. That's very likely. So as, that's an excellent rule of thumb of that work. This is, this is used um, kind of widely as a reference, reference point for, for the area. Um, and in fact, I should note the data is rather dramatic. If you look at all of these black points, they're all over the place on the left side, and it's 50% or more cyanose on the right side. Um, that was from a lot of work up in Canada. Um, the, uh, by the way, you may not know, but a lot of the work in Canada, they have lakes where they've actually done experiments on entire lakes. And fascinating research. You can take one lake, divide it in half, put a bunch of nutrients in one half and leave the other. It's really interesting research worth looking into for those who have an interest. The other part is they like, they like the water warm. Uh, if we look at the diatoms, for example, optimal growth is somewhere below 25, typically below 20 degrees centigrade, uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And the cyanos are generally uh, not happy at those low temperatures. They really don't start growing until you're above 20 degrees C, and they can clearly do very well. They're doing very well at up at 30 degrees. So they are very much oriented towards the warm temperatures. These Type of cyanobacteria. And the examples here are microcystis cylindris from Austin and Anabana as well. Um, thermal stratification just helps with that because the surface water is obviously warm up. Um, your, any deeper lakes in California would have very strong thermal stratification. Um, and so, and thermal stratification too does influence the vertical migration because if you have a strong um, a thermocline, they generally will not migrate through the thermocline. They'll tend to stay at the surface. They'll stand, tend to say, stay in the um, epilimnion, that's what it's called, near surface waters. Um, and uh, the uh, wind matters a lot. And this is a rather interesting. Um, Clear Lakes had blooms for a while, at least 40 years. and. Uh, some early work was actually done on remote sensing in Clear Lake from aircraft. And uh, I have two papers referenced, but the uh, uh, Bob Wrigley, who I actually knew he was at NASA Ames, had actually arranged to fly over there back in the early 70s with uh, um, uh, Professor Horn, who was at Berkeley. And uh, one of the things they found is that the winds cause mixing of, of the blooms, so you get the scum without. In and out. One of the early work determining that actually took place in Clear Lake. Um, and I have an example later. The, uh, I think the first paper of remote sensing with infrared data was actually infrared film over Clear Lake in the early 70s. So um, an interesting bit, but they observed that. From going to the modern with the uh, example we have, Lake Erie, this is uh, two different days, um, and the warm colors are the highest concentration. And you can see on the September 22nd, it's much lower than on the 23rd. And the winds were much different. Basically, the winds were strong, mixing the bloom through the water. What we've seen with satellite is surface concentration. And so if you mix that surface concentration through the whole water, it's lower. The whole biomass is reduced. So it comes back up to the surface when the wind calmed down. So just from one day to another, a dramatic difference in the amount of bloom at the, the surface concentration, as you'd see from satellite. Um, and I'm going to touch this later, so I won't uh, cover there. So on a short side, um, uh, many of the blooms you're dealing with, they tend to float. They come up to the surface. 
from a remote sensing point of view, that's convenient. They come up and wave at the satellite. Um, the, um, there's a number of important pigments besides chlorophyll. There's the phycoblin, phycocyanin, and phycourethrin. Phycocyanin is particularly useful, which we'll talk on later, um, and to help indicate that. And when mixing, your issues, of course, have to do with phosphorus um, and nutrient loading, which um, it's quite possible that as you go through the different lakes, you can compare lakes and different land use patterns and start drawing evaluations on those relationships overall. So that's end of this part one, and we'll take any questions now. Go ahead. So maybe you can just repeat my question. I, I think that's a good strategy. So the fact that the wind just mixes it, doesn't it just mask the signal? It doesn't mean that the spike, the, the microsystems aren't there, right? So if your water supply intake is low, you get a mix, you get a bad signal, right? Okay, what, if you're dealing with a water intake, um, okay, the question is, the mixing, do you have a change in the signal um, due to wind mixing from surface to bottom, and or bad the, signal? Does it mask the, uh, does it mask the signal? Um, okay, with the satellite, we are getting the surface concentration. Be like you take a water sample. You go out in a boat, you get a water sample. Not a vertical profile, you take a water sample, you have the surface concentration. Um, if you know, like we've we found, and uh, it's different lakes have slightly different thresholds for wind. And Lake Erie, we have found that uh, 15 knot winds mix it. Um, knowing that, we can make inferences about what the total biomass in the water column is. That's one part. If you're talking about a water intake, the interesting thing here is um, if you see it from satellite, you're probably okay for an intake <coughs> because the bloom's up at the surface. The mixing then, though, brings it down to the bottom where it's more of a risk for the intake of the manager. We're right now working on a, a model that we're hoping to be quite transportable, a mixing model that in order to predict when the bloom, how much the concentration will be near the bottom when the wind blows in order to capture that. But um, as, you, as you're going through from a monitoring point of view, you do need to keep in mind that you're dealing with um, what you see at the surface and then identify thresholds. So if yesterday you saw the satellite and there's no wind, today the wind is blowing 10 knots, that may mean that you now have that at the bottom. And it is, it's, when it mixes it, it's, it can be quite uniform, um, depending, of course, whether you have a thermocline and so forth to, in order to try to get at the intake. Uh, but you do have to keep that in mind from the point of view of in, intakes are a different issue than recreation, very definitely. Recreation's at the surface, the intakes are at the bottom. It doesn't matter. Um, and that, that's an application problem. So we can tell you how much biomass is in, in the water but where it is in the water is a different question that was required, that does require a model in order to get at. Some other questions? There was one online. Pardon? There was one online. Okay. So there was a question what sensors will be used for the program? Next part. I'll answer that. Okay, which sensors? We'll talk about that in the next part. So, that'll be covered in detail. Um, any others? Go ahead. Yeah. I'll try to repeat it if yeah. I can. If I... And, and when we think that kind of uh, uh, because the booming that you get by the wind, or is it something because of the cells are coming up to the surface? Because the satellite is receiving. Um, which could be vertical or horizontal. 
Um, when I, when we okay, I start off with the satellite, when we refer to the satellite, we see the near surface concentration, which could be scum if that's the case. You do not, um, we do not pick up with satellites um, the concentration in deep water. Um, the light gets attenuated going down, it gets attenuated coming up. So it's that concentration near the surface. When, um, if there's no wind at all, and you have a microcystis or phantom bloom, most of, most of the biomass will be up in the surface where the satellite can see it. So we now know the biomass on a calm, calm wind, um, calm condition. Um, so it's aggregated at the surface where we know where it is. The wind blows, it's now mixed into the water column again. That's, so that's one aggregation. Now another aggregation, if you have a light wind, not enough to mix it, so it floats up to the surface, the beaches on the downwind side of the lake will accumulate more because it's near the surface. And so that is a separate aggregation issue that um, potentially the satellite has some value at because you, you may get a larger pattern on one end of the lake than the other. But um, that's if we can't resolve it, that's something you need to be aware of is that which way the wind's blowing. So do you need to look on one side or another. That is, there's a sampling issue you can appreciate. Because you have that light wind and you go sampling on the upwind end of a lake, you might find very little bloom, whereas on the downwind side of the lake, you find an intense bloom overall. I don't know if they're completely answered, but maybe close. Oh, wait, Shelly has a comment. I was just, I have a comment. Um, we could, and we'll see this more in the final two years, but looking at daily Oh, yeah, I could, if you're talking in composite. You know, we do then take the daily industry and composite it over weeks and days to try and get an estimate of the total biomass of the biomass. So think about that later when you exercise exercises. There are ways to get around, um, you know, Yeah, we, we use, um, yes, compositing technique. And if you're asking trend analysis, um, when we get to trend, you're looking at trends, we, don't, we rarely work with dailies, daily imagery. Daily imagery is a monitoring immediate response issue overall. There's a couple other questions right here in the front row. Um, I was wondering if you could speak generally about the change in um, both the sampling protocol and the lab analysis over time in terms of the ease or the time and the cost involved um, for, these, for these different things. It's a very in-depth analysis and has it changed over time with our methods? Has the laboratory analysis or sampling methods changed over time? Is that the question? Well, could you just generally summarize the sampling, um, the ease of a sampling, the cost, the visualized analysis to be in depth versus being able to use satellite imagery? Um, I guess you use your, your lab analysis, sampling and lab analysis to verify your, your satellite imagery. So okay. The, the question of the ease of this and how, whether it simplifies or reduces sampling or analysis. Um, what we have, what we found is we need, um, for a given water body, you need less sampling um, overall because a huge issue is distributions in a large lake. Um, if you're dealing with your smaller lakes, um, um, you at least already have a, a, um, a likelihood that there's a bloom in the lake. And so you can make, you can make a judgment call as to what to do based on, on the data. Um, we've run across cases where, uh, a good example we had in Ohio, um, when we started doing uh, all the lakes outside of Lake Erie, um, we Ran, we evaluated, and there's one like Buckeye Lake, which we identified as having a potential bloom. Um, Buckeye Lake's a couple hours from Columbus, Ohio, where the Ohio EPA is. Um, the people there, they called up, there's a state park there, they called the state park. The ranger said, we know it's telling us, okay, I'm bragging a little on this one, I'll tell you the end of the story there, but no, it's telling us there's a potential problem on your lake. The guy looked out the window, the ranger looked and goes, the lake looks like it usually does. He doesn't see anything green scum on the surface. Can you get a sample? They got a sample, it's full of cylindrous bromopsis. It's the same khaki color it usually works. No idea. 
just because it didn't look like green paint. So from that perspective, the ease of monitoring is greatly improved because they have a potential indicator that there, there's a risk there. Uh, another part is you don't have to monitor all the time. If, you buy, if a bloom's been identified, um, whether confirmed from a field sample or not, you don't have to keep going to the sample the lake. You can watch and say, this lake's got an issue, we'll keep an eye on it. That, that's your call, but that is a potential management application that you can make that decision that um, uh, if you feel you have enough confidence in what it's producing, you do not have to sample it as often. Um, certainly there are places where, uh, you know, okay, you're in California, you got a big state here. Uh, we've been working with Massachusetts, okay, you know, one of those little bitty states. Uh, to go from Boston to, to the west, it's, it's a whole day out and back, just in a small state. They think there's a lake. Someone says there might be a problem, or they don't know. They got to drive four hours out of Boston. Like try driving out of Boston is like driving out of San Francisco, um, and then get one water sample, drive it back to the lab. That's a painful way to do to do work. So one of the things we could see is you can at least say we might have a problem here, here, and here. So what's our risk? What should we do with that? Um, so it doesn't quite answer the ease, but it potentially it potentially can you can you can better set up your monitoring program if you actually know where you're where you're looking at as a risk. That's what I would see as, as the value there. Um, as far as the toxicity, there's a lot of work going on on like there's some indication that once blooms hit certain biomass levels that they may always be toxic. That's work that needs to be done. But if you hit those kind of answers, you might go you know. We just hit this threshold, it's probably toxic, so we'll just assume it is instead of going and getting a sample. That's a scenario you could, those, those are scenarios you could potentially explore as options. Um, so I would say what's very important from our side is we're not trying to create something, so you have to go and sample and validate or ground truth every single lake that we say something. The idea is that we've identified something that says these lakes are a likely risk, and then what is your? Then you can make a, a appropriate management strategy to to go from there. Question, second round. Yeah. <clears throat> After a strong wind event, how long does it take for the the uh, bacteria or bacteria or algae to rise up to the surface? To be it can be the next day. One day. Yes. Okay. If the wind dies down, um, ten ten meters. A day, easily. I'd say hours. We, we, were, we were out at Lake Erie in the morning, spring came. We really couldn't see the balloon by the afternoon on a sample. Yeah. So uh, just for those on the phone, it could be hours uh, because it again, like the colony size matters. If there are small colonies, which is earlier on in the bloom, they take longer to rise. Um, Anyone do any uh, uh, water fluid dynamics, rental stresses? Yeah, everybody's raising their hand. Of course you did. <laughs> exactly. Well, bigger ones rise faster. They also settle faster too. So, but it's yeah. If you have large colonies, it potentially is hours. Um, we have seen differences between 10 a.m. in the morning and 2 in the afternoon imagery. Uh, the first. Uh, we two more questions, then we take a break. I got some more online. Okay. One in the room and one online, and then, okay. So I was just wondering about, uh, maybe you'll get to this later, about trending and mapping a composite. And is it somewhere like in the Bay where it's idle uh, rather than uh, a lake environment? I was just wondering how the impact of the tide might affect your trending ability. Uh, with cyanobacteria in the worst part of the lake, that's not a problem because they're rare. Um, Can you repeat the question, please? But, oh, the question is, tidal uh, trending overall, and particularly places like San Francisco Bay where you have tidal currents, which make life really interesting. Uh, yes. I have done some work on San Francisco Bay, and it is very interesting in that regard. Uh, generally, the cyanobacteria, are, I believe, are relatively rare as well as it's been picked up. When you get into the delta, you still got some tides. Um, we've picked up blooms. I don't think it's an issue, but it's a good question that I can't give you a particularly good answer, as you can guess right now. Um, you had one online. So there were two questions online. 
Um, one was about sensors again. Um, that's actually maybe more for us. Um, what kind of sensors SFAI is planning to use other than other than NOAA's? And the answer is we're not pretty. So Rick is going to talk about sensors later and what they can do and what they can't do in, in more general terms. And we're really um, we're really we're really using NOAA's satellite imaging data that we're working with. So we're not we're not planning on doing any of our own sensor work. Um, the other question was, um, someone was wondering about the use of cameras mounted somewhere above ground near monitoring region. Is that something you wanted to talk about, Rick? Uh, yeah, then uh, after cameras are going to get the ground. Um, there are some things you can do with cameras as a crude estimate of eutrophication or presence. Um, if you get real clever and dismantle the cameras, you can and take some filters out, you can do a little more with them, actually. And uh, But that's that's a great one to connect with um, somebody like Mabari on <laughs> um, to work through some of those things. Um, but it, it leads to some other monitoring options. Um, I don't think I want to go too much further on that. There are some interesting possibilities. Um, I have looked at at least some basic camera stuff. It's interesting possibilities. They're not ready for routine use, though. There's one more in this room, and then maybe we take a, a break till yeah, a short break. Was there one more question in the back, or are we we're good? Okay. Um, what time is it now? 10 of 11? Should we get start again at 11? Give you guys time for both your other presentations by noon? Sure. We do have a hard deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Repeat the question. The, the question is we need to be done by noon. So the faster you get back in here, the sooner we can get going and ask you the questions that you all were asking about. Okay, remote sensing. Crash course on remote sensing. Everything you'll all be experts in the next half hour on remote sensing of algorithms. All right. Um, well, I might as well get to the end here. So if you don't know anything else, you can remember this. We're concentrating on cyanobacteria for this project. Um, it will. We will be picking up with the satellite data some other algal blooms, but we're not picking up all other algal blooms. So you will get some others, but if you've got other eutrophication problems, we are we are not providing any guarantees or promises about those. Cyanobloons are observable. As I said, they like to float up to the surface. Most of them float up to the surface and wave hello. Um, they are distinguishable from other blooms depending on the sensor. Um, and I'll touch on that because it does depend on what you're working with. We have some uncertainties on our distinction between cyanos and non-cyanos, even with the Maris or Olchi that we're, we'll be using, but we can, you know, wait to do that. Scum. Any sensor can find scum. Um, and that has to do with the algae and scum. It reflects near infrared light really, really strongly. We can't see near infrared light, but it is bright. All these scums are brighter in the infrared than they are in the green. So if we could see infrared light, it would be blindingly bright um, overall. Um, most sensors have limitations, and there are trade-offs, which I'll touch on, on resolution. And then there are experimental systems and radiometers and cameras and things that we're not going to touch on, but they could be they're worth looking for in the future for other options to go locally. Okay. Uh, first remote sensing of algal bloom, Clear Lake, 1974. It was infrared film. Color infrared film actually was used for agriculture. And uh, again, this is uh, this was published in Nature. It's quite a deal. So I suppose the Clear Lake people here should feel honored that they they actually advanced the uh, whole topic of remote sensing. Um, overall, on, on resolution. Let's start off. There are three resolution issues with satellites. We have spectral resolution. How many bands are there? How many wavelengths of light do we pick up? We think of blue, green, red, ultraviolet, and infrared. Okay. You probably, everyone remember your physics, Roy G. Biv? 
Okay. Uh, right, red, orange, green, red, orange, yellow, green, whatever, cyan, blue, yeah, something like that. Um, well, there's a whole lot more. There are many wavelengths of light. Anyway, depends on how many bands you have. Temporal resolution. How often do you get an image? Is it every day, every week, every month? Temporal resolution is an issue. And spatial resolution. How much ground is detected in each pixel? Now, the last two, by the way, temporal and spatial, they're inverse. You want more spatial resolution, you have to give up temporal resolution. Um, the practical part is there's only so much data that this, this telescope cannot be big enough, the sensors aren't big enough to do both at the same time. So if you want every day, you're not going to get every day at 10 meters or 1 meter. It just doesn't, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Um, so there is a trade there. Now, for satellites, this was asked before, um, the basic satellites that have been available are all available. All available. The MERA sensor, which we'll be talking about, OLCHI, which will be its replacement going up later this year. Um, there's MODIS, um, which is a high resolution, low resolution Landsat, and Sentinel-2, which is going up next month. Um, and these are color coded. Um, and I apologize for anyone who's, uh, who has color Red, green, I think I got them right. Anyway, green is very good. Um, this is okay. The yellow, the orange is so-so, and the red is not so good. Maris hits the best compromise. It's not the optimal spatial resolution. 300 meter pixels means if the water body, uh, we normally say three pixels is resolution. I'll show why. We have a limitation about one kilometer. Um, we're doing some work to get a little better than that. Um, but it has the temple and the key spatial resolution. It has several bands. Key thing is it has five bands in the red and near infrared. We think of red and infrared as two. It's got five bands, and that will be very important. The others we have issues. Uh, Landsat is a well-known one. The big challenge Landsat has, biggest one is the temporal resolution. With blends of seven and eight, that's every eight days, assuming it's not cloudy. You might get one scene in a, you know, one scene a month perhaps with that. The other, of course, with some of the other sensors is they just have fewer bands, one red, one near red. That's a limitation on that regard. So the reason for Maris is we're getting the temporal resolution, spectral resolution with spatial resolution. So that covers the, the other satellites. <laughs> we'll go into Maris here. I hope that answered all the questions there. Uh, Maris is a little uh, Maris was launched on MBSAT April 2002, ceased operations in April 2012. Unfortunately, the uh, European Space Agency lost communication with the satellite. Um, this is one of these, no idea what happened. Could have been hit by a meteor. We I just simply don't know. Um, they had already planned for the launch of the OLG afterwards. Spectral resolution, 13 visible bands, spatial 300 meters, um, little involved, but basically 300 meters, and typically about three to four scenes a week. Um, Free. We don't have to pay for the data. That's always good. And of course, the replacement Ulchi on the Sentinel 3. And Ulchi, by the way, one of their headquarters is in Frascati, Italy. OLCI is not Ulchi then, it's Ulchi. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, Sentinel 3A this year, Sentinel 3B is supposed to go up in about two years from now. That would be, um, and then a Sentinel 3C two to three years after that. So they will be up to full one day coverage with the 300 meters. Just to give you an idea of what this, we talk about what it looks like, this is the Maris. This, this is, these are actual swaths. Um, sorry, it's not California, it's the Great Lakes, but I didn't think it could change um, that. They actually fly north to south. So this odd orientation you see here is just the way it works. But you can see the width of the swath um, in this case. And when we talk about the coverage that being three to four a week, well, it doesn't fly exactly the same path every day. The repeat is actually for Maris, I don't remember, maybe every 16 days is the exact repeat on the cycle. But you can see that, um, you know, you look here, Lake Superior shows up there. There's actually Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is there, but you don't get it on this day, then you get it on this day, and you don't get it on this day. You might get two days in a row, miss a couple of days, and so forth. So that's kind of the coverage. 
They're also angled a little bit, and you'll see that in the California data. The orientation is sort of northeast to southwest, so it doesn't fly straight down the coast. If it covers northern California, it might not pick up the Salton Sea. Not that you're worried about the Salton Sea, but it probably won't pick it up. If it picks up that, you might not get um, Humboldt or Eureka. Do I have my geography down okay here? Good. Um, again, the Maris replaced an Ulchi late 2015 launch, um, and uh, they haven't set the date. The great thing is the satellite is all assembled. They're doing the last testing on it um, now, um, uh, ESA is. Um, it will have a slightly wider swath. 300 meter data will be routine, which was not quite routine with Maris. It actually had a, a lot of the data from California was recorded um, onboard recorders um, until 2008 when there was a station in Canada that started getting it routinely. So, um, and again, the follow up to that later. Okay, now let me talk a little on resolution, spatial resolution. When I say 300 meter pixel, we might say, okay, well then, if we have a 300 meter lake, we're good. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, if you have mixed land and water, you have a pixel that's partially land, partially water. Um, okay, we're looking for chlorophyll. Is there anything on the land that has chlorophyll? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything that has a lot of chlorophyll, at least in the winter or spring in California. Yeah, there's trees and all sorts of stuff. California poppies and wildflowers. Well, so if you put, if you have a mixed pixel, that's how I classify this, we can't tell you what's in the water. It's overwhelmed, the signal's totally overwhelmed by the land. The land's also very bright for any number of reasons. It doesn't work. So we, we really need to have a clean pixel that has only water in it. So we, our rule of thumb is three pixels. Doesn't matter what sensor, three pixels, with. Um, we've done a lot of processing on the data in order to make sure we're not doing mixed pixels. So there will be lights occasionally where we can do better than, we can pick up the two pixel wide, but as a rule of thumb, this is why, because we can't have the mixed pixel. We do not have the information content. But we, we do identify those in the processing. So you or your GIS people don't have to do that. We do it for you. Sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay, but this is a key point. The, at least the rule of thumb is it needs to be three pixels across. Occasionally you can get a little more information. Um, and just to give an example, these are some, some, some water bodies. Um, I happen to, and so you can get a sense of this, of areas where it just doesn't work once you're down to one pixel wide. You can see the red is high vegetation, by the way, the way I colored this, so that bright red. But you can see some of these one or two pixel wide ones were picking up a lot of that other, uh, you know, other, um, they're definitely mixed pixels. So some will work out and some won't. This is pretty typical for reservoirs. Okay, so spatial resolution. You're now experts on that, right? Three pixels. Okay, now we'll get to, get to the harder stuff. Um, um, the, uh, Spectral resolution. Okay, um, I've actually put in the, the visible spectra, the top and the bottom, and ultraviolet is over here, infrared is over here. This is, by the way, reflected infrared. Everyone heard of thermal infrared, right? Temperature. People normally think of infrared as thermal. There's also reflected infrared light, and that is literally, it's just like visible light except we can't see it. Um, to digress completely, fascinating thing how reflected infrared light was discovered. Anyone here happen to know? There's this guy, William Herschel, brilliant astronomer, and he was curious about light, he, light warms things, warms things up. So he took a thermometer, took a prism, put a thermometer, and decided to see whether blue light or orange light or red light changed the temperature, and they found that the temperature warmed up more in its thermometer as you got to longer wavelengths. It happens to be the absorption properties of alcohol and water. They absorb more at longer wavelengths. Well, then he said, what if he moved it just past the red on the prism, and it warmed up even more? He goes, ah, well, that's past red. I'm going to call that infrared. So it was invented. He discovered it. Now, 
just to follow this through completely, ultraviolet light is not absorbed, so the thermometer didn't work there. But there's a guy uh, whose name escapes me completely, which I'm sorry, Johan Ritter. And he had discovered this stuff, silver chloride, which reacts with light. And he found it reacted more with light as it got to shorter and shorter wavelengths. So red light did not react very well, blue did. And he had just read, the year before, Herschel just published his report on infrared light. So Ritter said, what if I put my sodium chloride just on the other end of the blue or the violet? He discovered ultraviolet. So you now can do two physics experiments here at home. Just need a prism. Anyway, um, we're not worried about ultraviolet. Um, what I have are several bands here. They're color-coded. And the, there are several things in the water. If we, we'll reduce this simply. We have sediments. Everyone knows what that is, mud, whatever. There's tannins. Tannins are like what's in your tea, black water. Anyone seen a black water swamp, peat swamp? That's a tannin. They absorb blue light incredibly strongly. That's why it looks brown. Then there's algae, pigments. Now, that gets interesting because there's chlorophyll, which absorbs blue and red. There's carotenoids, which absorb greenish light. That's why carrots end up being orange, because all the green is gone from there. And then you have the, the phycoblin pigments. But anyway, you have three categories of stuff. Well, all of them absorb blue light. So if you're in a lake, where you probably have tannins, you have sediment, you have algae, you're not going to tell anything useful about the water looking at blue light. If you're in the ocean, where some of the sensors were developed, there's no sediment, there's no tannins, there's no algae. So for ocean, these blue, blue and green bands are fabulous for identifying chlorophyll. So that's not helpful. The green um, area is a lot of uh, reflectance from sediment and not so much from pigments. Now we have two other interesting ones here. This is PC, and that's not politically correct. This is phycocyanin, um, and it happens to absorb around 620 nanometers. Phycocyanin, by the way, cyanin blue, that's what it means. Pure phycocyanin is this very beautiful blue color because it absorbs all of that um, orange, yellow light completely. It's this cyan blue-green color, really, really striking appearance. And then chlorophyll, which absorbs very strongly in the red. Um, you know, leaves are green because the blue and the red are absorbed. Well, all the red is absorbed incredibly strongly. So if you want to find stuff where there's a lot of other things, you need to work here in the red-orange wavelengths in order to pick out blooms and lakes with lots of stuff in it. That's part one. So we're looking for, we need satellites that have bands in these wavelengths. The second part is phycocyanin. If we want to identify lots of stuff has chlorophyll, if we want to look for the blooms, we need the phycocyanin. So it really helps to have information there. Well, if we look at the different sensors, Landsat has one broad red band that covers all of this stuff. Uh, MODIS has a broad red band, CWIS. Maris has a band right on the 620 nanometers. It was specifically put there to try to pick up phycocyanin. That's actually why I was put on that band. Then it has two bands around the chlorophyll right here, 665 and 681. What happens to the absorption of the other fluorescence? An interesting bit with is cyanobacteria is they don't fluoresce, which proves to be useful for us also. So that's a key factor here on why the merits is a particular value, because we have these bands here to pull that information out. And we have several of them to work with that. Just to show those pigments, um, here again in the red, here's the chlorophyll peak. Oh boy, I can't quite read these. Uh, yeah, phycocyanin and then some of the other pigments, which I can't quite read the fine print either. Oh, there's phycoerythrin also. Oscillatoria is a often attached cyanobacteria. It often looks black. People have seen that sometimes. The reason it's black is because it's got chlorophyll, which absorbs blue and the red. It's got phycocyanin, which absorbs the orange, and it has phycoerythrin, which absorbs the green. And if you do the math there, there's nothing left to absorb, so it tends to look black. That's a typical um, oscillatoria because it has all of those. Now, 
if we um, so if we put all these together, this is the absorption of of all of several different types and over the wavelengths. And a lot of blue light is absorbed. This is down here. This is chlorophyll absorption, and this bump here is phycocyanin absorption. So if you if you put a bunch of cyanobacteria and you absorb that. And I won't try to explain the reflectance. But if you absorb it, it does not, it's well. Reflectance is the reserve reverse of absorption. If light is absorbed, it doesn't come out and you don't see it. So what we're seeing for satellite is we're measuring the reflectance of the water. The more it absorbs, the lower the reflectance. The more phycocyanin, the more chlorophyll, the lower the reflectance, the less there is. And so we're interested in those components. What's very important about these, though, is these variations. So one band, like chlorophyll, absorbs a lot right here, and it doesn't absorb so much here or here. So if we put those together, we can use that information um, to gain what we're looking for. So here is an example. This is an example spectra from a microcystis bloom. And you can see, absorbed, we'll do the easy part. We've absorbed all the blue light. We've absorbed all the red, most of the red light. And what's left is, can anyone say what's left? What comes out of the water? What's reflected? Green. Yes. There's a big peak of green. That's why it looks green, because of that. But these parts are the interesting. If I go signing, we have a dip here, and we have a dip here on the chlorophyll, and that's what we're going after. Everyone remember calculus? Of course you remember calculus. Uh, uh, first derivative, second derivative. First derivative is slope. Second derivative is the curve. We're looking at curvature. Here's a nice curve. Here's a nice curve. One great characteristic on first and second on derivatives, which I'm sure you remember really well, is it doesn't matter where you are on a graph, the curve is always the same. It's a huge advantage when working with this data. Um, I won't go into atmosphere correction problems, but most of what you see from satellite is the atmosphere, and it's really hard to remove when you're in lakes. So what we try to do is we're going with curvature. We don't have that problem. It doesn't matter where we are. It also gets rid of the sediment problem. No one's yet asked, asked that. How do you tell the difference between this and sediment? Sediment moves the whole curve up and down. Pigments produce little curves. So it doesn't matter where you are, the curve's the same. So this particular method by using the curvature uh, calculus, who would ever believe that calculus would be useful after you finish high school? <laughs> um, and it's actually very easy to calculate. That's actually cool. Numerical calculus is incredibly simple. You wouldn't believe, but it's incredibly simple, not like what you actually had to do. Um, how simple is it? Well, computationally, what you do is you draw a line, a baseline, and you take the distance from the line, and you've just created a second derivative. Pretty cool, huh? You don't have to remember what is it, the dx, dy equals whatever. That's what you do. So we're doing, we're actually doing two of them. One for, to get the chlorophyll, this is the dip caused by chlorophyll absorption. So that amount of curvature is how much biomass there is. We use chlorophyll because it's a, it's a stable, reliable measure of biomass, much more than phycocyanin is as a metric. Because phycocyanin as a pigment gets, as a protein gets produced and eliminated if it doesn't need it. Um, but this is very effective for getting that chlorophyll. And we use it for cell, concentrate, uh, cell count concentration. Now, how effective is it? Well, here's the relationship between the CI and chlorophyll. This is data we had from um, Florida. Really nice relationship, isn't it? Yes, very useful. And we found this works in other places, not just Florida. We've also come up with a relationship to cell count. Remember the WHO, I said 100,000 cells per mil is a threshold. So we asked the question, well, how well are we? We came up with a relationship for Lake Erie. This is not the relationship for Lake Erie. This is a relationship for Lake Erie applied to lakes in New England and Florida, one to one fifth. We're pretty confident that if it works in Ohio, Florida, and New England, that it will work out here on California. So to come up with the amount of cell, con the cell count, cell concentration. So that's the relationship we'd work from. 
Um, and just to, actually, I think I have a better one. Now this will work. Um, in order to identify the cyanobacteria, the curvature shows up right in this area. And if it's not a cyanobloom, you notice how it curves, it goes up curvature, and if we have a bloom, it's curved down here. Um, now that's that phenomenon. Let me skip to another. Anyway, so that's the pattern there. I don't really need that one here. Um, the scum part, this is a reflectance of scum. I said it reflects in the near-infrared far more strongly than the green. So that's very easy to pick up, but our same relationships still work. Notice our chlorophyll dip right here and our phycocyanin dip right here. We can still pull that out, that information here from those, even though we have this huge, much more reflectance in the near-infrared than the green. As I said, if we could see infrared and you're looking at the scum, you'd need infrared sunglasses to see this because it would be so bright. Um, how does this translate out? Oh, this Lake Erie example, um, we're not in the best room here, but certainly you can see the very vivid green. This is actually scum in this area. And you can see when we come up with this, the cyano index, the total biomass index, how that shows up very clearly in this area in here. But also things like sediment. This is sediment coming out of the Troy River plume. It is not identified at all, which is exactly how it should be. Different year, different phenomena. You can see the most intense bloom is in this area, and this is now, we're, we're at a level we can quantify this. Um, just to make it clear about trying to tell the difference with a true color picture, um, and so we're working with quantifiable rather than true color, you wouldn't be able to tell from that true color that that's where the bloom is. And that's what we're working with for this. Okay. Now, the separation of cyanos and non cyanos. Um, this is um, example data. And what we have is the, the phycocyanin changes out here. So we end up with a curvature right at this point. Little dip downward if it's phycocyanin, and you see it goes valley upward if it's a diatom. Um, this is actually data from a diatom bloom in. San Francisco Bay, and this is uh, Clear Lake. By the way, I actually found real data from California. I figured you'd appreciate that. But um, that distinction is subtle, but it's, it's, it's a real uh, real issue caused by the phycocyanin change. And the practical part is there's just no phycocyanin, so this tends, tends to stay high, and it depresses it down relative to the other. So we use that as a curvature. So we do this as a presence absence issue. Most, most cyanobacteria have less phycocyanin than they do chlorophyll, and phycocyanin does not absorb as strong as chlorophyll, so that's part of the reason why we go for chlorophyll as the actual biomass metric rather than uh, phycocyanin. Okay, some examples of this. <clears throat> um, Clear Lake, we have the, um, the identification, this happens to be CI that we called cyano versus the total CI. And you can see that the whole, there's basically very little bloom at all in this early time. And this particular bloom hit um, in mid July um, over 130 micrograms per liter chlorophyll. And you can see how it all shows up. And we're picking that up just fine. So this is the total biomass, this is total CI. And this is what we're calling cyano. The whole bloom is a cyanobloom at this point. But you can see how it develops. Very, it first hints in the lower arm, which is still not popping out. And then, of course, it exploded over that time period. Um, example from a non cyano, San Francisco Bay. Um, I should say down here, this little bit here, those are those salt cans. They're full of all kinds of interesting things, including cyanobacteria and a lot of stuff. But there's actually spring bloom here, which we identified as non-cyano, and but potentially up to 20 to or 30, 40 micrograms per liter of chlorophyll. This is a USGS data down there. So the bloom, there was a bloom there that was showing up, but we're identifying it as a non-cyano bloom based on this cur other curvature. So the quantity here is total biomass chlorophyll biomass. The presence absence is the phycocyanin identified. People get that. 
if people are nodding yes in the room, then I assume people are nodding yes on the phone. Okay. Uh, people did ask about the depth into the water. I'll touch on this a little bit. Um, if you have really clear water, um, light penetrates in far and it comes back out far. A, 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 we use as a rough rule of thumb one secchi disc is about the maximum depth the satellite sees. For the red bands we're working with, it's actually shallower than that, but then again, it's not too much shallower because if you get into really turbid water, all the blue lights absorb, so the secchi disc is going to be only picking up red light anyway, so it's still pretty close. But a rule of thumb, if you want the rule of thumb as how far in we're picking up a signal, it's one secchi depth. It works pretty well. If the water gets too clear, that doesn't work, but then we're not interested. No one here is worried about any lights where the water is that clear. If you had that clear, you wouldn't have a sign of one. So as a rule of thumb, that you could say that. Um, the last thing on the wind, just uh, which this, I didn't realize how much interest there were on that, but just to remind you of this, um, yeah, and, uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Wynn, came up with this great cartoon. If you have a nice sunny day and it's calm, well, they're all above the psyche depth. You see the psyche disk, right? They're all happily above there. We can see it just fine. And somewhere, oh, there's supposed, there was an animation at one time. But then the wind blows. And the question here is, there were eight. All eight were in the surface, visible from satellite when it was calm. We're only getting four at the surface. We made sure we did the math correctly. So we're, we're, the satellite will pick up half the concentration when the wind blows. So if we know the wind's blowing and we knew what it was when it's calm, and Shelley touched on this, we're, at, we're doing compositing. So we can come up with a total biomass. You can actually come up with those numbers to work on that. Um, and we are working on more involved models. Okay. And just to show how this actually pops out with the satellite data, up here, this is the total amount of satellite, this is the area and amount of um, concentration over the whole area for these four images. And then uh, we have the wind patterns. You can see no wind during this time and a lot of bloom, high concentration, strong wind event right afterwards. Um, it's been reduced, then it gets calm, it all pops up to the surface, the wind blows, and it all is mixed back down. So you go back and forth there. So if you want to know how much bloom there is in the water, you look at these calm days, and that tells us what the bloom is. And so the caveat is, if you had a windy day, you don't want to be looking at that and saying, this is how much bloom, this is the total biomass, because this is not the total biomass. This is a good estimate of biomass of bloom in the water. Okay, um, the ULTI data, um, kind of getting into the satellite part, but a few improvements. Merit has problems with sun glint. Um, actually, most satellites do. Sun glint, I think everyone's been in a boat. You know, when you look in the sun, you get blind. It's not quite that extreme, but you get enough speckle here that it causes interference. Um, ULTI is actually pointed slightly away from the sun so that it will avoid that problem. So we'll retrieve more data with ULCI than we're getting with MERA. Um, Two-day repeat with one satellite, it's slightly wider swath, so it'll be pretty reliably a two-day, and once the second one is one-day repeat. And it will always be 300 meter data over land, and then we'll have availability through the uh, Cyan Project, which I think I've got another slide on. Cyan Project is what uh, Thomas and Karen had mentioned before. That's a Cyan Assessment Network, that's the joint and I don't have EP, oops, I don't have EPA on here. Uh, Blake, get out. Yeah, and Blake Schaefer, uh, I'm the NOAA lead on this. Blake Schaefer is the overall lead for the project. Blake Schaefer of EPA. So, um, uh, anyway, the product type will be the same as Merit. We, by the way, uh, worked out uh, NOAA through our satellite service has an agreement with ESA to get data as soon as it's available. So we'll be able to start evaluating it soon as it shows up, even before it's declared operational. I don't know what that is. Okay, and a brief thing on the Cyan project. The, the goal here is to be go national with uh, cyanobacteria uh, based on satellite data. This is Maris data. You all are at the cutting edge here. 
of this. Um, we have, um, most of the regions are supporting this. And um, the lead starting areas are Ohio, Florida, and California um, in order to, to uh, do validation uh, and do beta testing of the projects. But we've also got other partners, the Army Corps, <coughs> um, of course, various parts of EPA. And USGS is involved too. Um, the uh, overall is to take the satellites, take the MARIS data, the ULTI data that we're working with, um, apply just what you're doing here, apply that nationally. And um, the examples there, the overall approach is to end out with a uniform approach for the remote sensing. So it's not a matter of every scene has to be processed manually, every lake has to be validated or such individually, it's standard processing that works reliably, exactly what we're doing, we're transferring here. Um, so you can appreciate all of that. Probably the more interesting parts are um, the, um, the automated processing for Ulchi, which means it'll go in through what uh, described, Karen described earlier and SFEI and so forth, so that data will show up to you all. Also working on an app, smartphone apps, and the first app has been developed by EPA. The idea is you have a point, it will grab the data, the satellite data we have, and if you have a particular place you're interested in, it will produce a notice of what the current status of that is and over the last couple of weeks. And we're going to be doing the first test on that to see if it works. They won't be in California this summer, they'll be in Ohio for Lake Erie um, because we don't have the ULCI data and Lake Erie is big enough to work. But the idea is if you're interested in a particular place, you will actually be able to get that kind of notification. So there'll be, we're looking at several levels of concept here. The image-based approach that we're using here for whole GIS, whole lake approaches, and then also kind of a monitoring uh, real-time network. The idea is to get several ways to get the data out to you all, to the managers throughout, and to roll this out across the country. That's, that's the overall goal. Um, the real kickoff of this will be in the fall, but there are some other developments. And the basic idea is to cover these sorts of things. And EPA wants to deal with better decision making under the various the Clean Water Act and so forth. And you can probably think of any number of things. But the idea is to come up with better ways to get the information to see you and people like you in all these other states. And there's absolutely no way that my my group, our you know, and NOAA or at EPA can evaluate every, every lake in California, needless to say, every lake in the country. The idea is to get it to a point where it's simple and easy for you to do this without you having to know everything about second derivatives. That's the goal. Okay. So, why don't I move on to part three so we can get through that. And hopefully, if people have more questions, then they can probably fill them in. Is there a key one on the chat that we really need to cover or no? Well, there's one question. Uh, hey, Sue, what's our, what's our, our we, have, we have 20 minutes. Can we get to the next presentation in 20 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Like 30, 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes? Um, there was some, um, is there any monitoring folks can do on the lake to correct for a sensor? Yeah, any monitoring people can do to correct the sensor? simple. If you actually collect data because you're monitoring for other purposes, get it to us. And what, what uh, we, we, well, the key one is just to make sure if we're calling it cyanobacteria, it is. And it's probably chlorophyll. chlorophyll is useful and the microcystin would be, and that the microcystin, we're, we're looking at, we're exploring the question of are there any environmental conditions that allow us to predict when microcystin will occur in its presence? So getting that information might help us model it to do better for you because there's any number of amount of environmental data we can get. So, but we, I should emphasize, we're not asking for anyone to collect more data than they're collecting now. It's if you're doing it, the key thing is getting, is having that data so we can confirm this. Because then it makes it easier to make sure we're doing this correctly. One last question, then I'll go to the next talk from the room. So with the on the ground? 
uh, from Aaron's one kilometer. However, let me show you some examples here, okay? Got some, there, there's some ways to handle the data that gives us a little room. All right, so applications in California. We got exactly 30 minutes now. Yep, yeah. we're good, okay. We've been doing a lot, obviously, in Lake Erie and other places. Um, we've had a bulletin up in that area for the blooms. Um, by the way, Lake Erie is large. It's a great lake, not a small lake, um, like 300 kilometers long. That's um, 50, 60 kilometers wide, 300 kilometers. That doesn't quite get from, what is that, San Francisco down to Santa Barbara, something like that? Yeah, that's it's big. So. Um, anyway, we've been monitoring there and doing forecasts and that sort of thing. Cool thing, like on this side, is you're actually looking at this is a forecast three days out based on a hydro model. So if you have any lakes where you have information based on any sort of patterns, you could actually potentially do the same thing. Um, and we managed to get it to work with MODIS at one kilometer data. It's not pretty, but it works. Um, but um, we don't want to push that for here. Um, now, what you can do with this, one of the questions I've seen come out is trends, and what does that mean? Well, in Lake Erie, we've looked at that. We came up with, for each year, an estimate of this, this bloom severity. There's an annual bloom. And so what you see here is the map of the bloom each year from 2002 to 14. 2002 to 11 are the merits data. And you can see it varies between years. And then here's the phosphorus. This is a phosphorus load. You can see on the big phosphorus years, Big loads, you had cyanose. Relationship, now it's possible with this to, we're now doing predictions. Each year now, for the last three years, we predicted how big the bloom will be in Lake Erie. Um, that's one. The other is they're trying to deal with the phosphorus. How much, what's the target to reduce it? We now have the data in order to do that, to do that phosphorus reduction. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the U.S. and Canada, which is EPA response is overseeing that from the U.S. side. It's trying to come up with phosphorus targets to get rid of these blooms. This modeling is key to that. So you can let your imaginations go as far as what you might want to do. But this is examples of the merits data and the potential that can be applied. Um, and you could do this kind of analysis with the data you, you will get. You've seen this before. So just to remind you, we can find blooms. We do need merits if we really want to separate separate them out, and um, anything can find scum, and we have resolution trade-offs. Um, oh, sampling scale. Okay, you get a water sample. Um, a, a, a word that bothers me, I'll say a term, is ground truth. Truth is for philosophers. Um, you get a water sample, that's, your rep that's an approximation of reality, of truth. Our satellite data is a model, that's an approximation. What I'd like to say is here you are at Stadium, nice Sunday afternoon at Levi Stadium. You go and get the sample of one cup and analyze, are we in a government building? The alcohol content in that one cup. And you're gonna tell me what the total amount is in that stadium. We measure it in the entire stadium. That's the comparison you're trying to make with one water sample. And cyanoblooms are really patchy. I think you've all seen that. And when you're in a boat, you're saying, wow, I see scum out, who knows how far? Well, who knows how far is about to the building about um, 80 or 90 feet away. After that, you can't tell. So you're really, um, there's a huge difference between the water sample and the satellite. And we've, we've, we've seen that. So keep that in mind on the water sample. It's really important to know what it is it's really hard to come up with a concentration that will match what the satellite tells us. Because we're doing the whole stadium, you're doing one cup. So this relationship was done with a handheld radiometer pointed at the water that was in the sample. That's why we came up with an excellent relationship. The satellite one is, is fits the one-to-one -one line, but um, it's not, you have, it doesn't work that way. So. But we do have the relationship to chlorophyll. So um, a few examples of data now. A clear scene and true color down here. This is the CI up above. 
very clear day. Um, yeah, I can't, I'm not sure the exact date. You can see the uh, little salt ponds there, but a few lakes here are kind of interesting. By the way, that's out in Nevada, so I guess we should delete that, right? We don't, that's, <laughs> now that's Mono Lake. Uh, so that's an example of data, and you can see various lakes. So lake is actually kind of clear on this particular day overall. Uh, it's clear of algae. <clears throat> now, there are other things that go on. Um, edge of Swath, which you can't quite tell, but we're actually on the edge of Swath, so we do get San Francisco Bay, but not up here. Um, and then in this area, all the lakes are gray. There's a fog in the Central Valley. We can't see the clouds. So, so in this case, we can tell you a lot about these lakes over here. We can tell you nothing about these lakes on this particular scene. Now, I should say, anytime anyone has satellite data, they always show you these things. They don't show you the rest of the scene. So you all are going to get all the rest of the scene. <laughs> um, Different, I mentioned glint. Um, we generally mask glint right now. This coloring, oh, by the way, when you look at individual scenes, they will look like this. They will have these color schemes. The glint areas are masked out as with an invalid data product. You can see how the glint looks really bright in this area. And we're actually also an edge of swath, so we're getting no information in this area. So um, we're valid in San Francisco Bay. We're there's no information content there. So that's one of the things we process, though. We, we, we try to process all of these to identify glint, clouds, and other invalid data that's not actually water blooms. So just to get an idea of that, that's the range of, of things that you can potentially run across. And there will be scenes where, um, yeah, you can run into circumstances and periods of time where you're off the edge of swath and then it was cloudy. I can't, we can't guarantee, just because we can get an image every day doesn't mean you're going to get a clear, usable image for your lake every single day. That's one of the reasons we end up compositing the data up to 10 day periods is to remove those kind of phenomena. Um, now, in a time series, from the point of view of what else can you see from the data, this is Clear Lake over. Um, Sure, it's over 2009 from um, June up till um, December, and we've gotten data reporting the bloom. Yes, this is not us. This is clearly like people saying there was a bloom. Was a bloom? Yes, 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 yes. And we clearly find the bloom. They did not sample. We would assume the reason they didn't sample is because there wasn't a bloom. So we don't have an actual valid no, but it seems reasonable to think that there wasn't one. And so in over most of this. So there was clearly a bloom over this time period, and it was not present in that time period. Example of getting the time series data that you potentially can get from region. And notice that um, um, the arm down here, uh, east arm? Lower arm, OK. Clearly has more, which is, I think, what most of you are who no clear wake are familiar with. Now, a little different way to look at it is this is an extraction. The data on the bottom is a time series, and this is data that extracted uh, the people who are doing the GIS. You will be able to get this kind of data out of, out of the imagery. So um, by the end of tomorrow, you will be able to do that. So anyone who's not with it, you can ask them, how, did I, how do you get this product? So here's the time series. This is through 2009 to 2010. There's a few gaps here because there were no retrievals, because it was cloudy, glint off edge of swath. Um, Canada, by the way, when Canada was collecting data in uh, 2009, 10, and 11, uh, Maris was a, a non-paying customer. They also had a paying customer. And they had two receivers, one antenna, which was really good, and one which was cheap. Well, guess what happened when the paying customer wanted data? Merit's got the cheap antenna. We didn't always pick up, and the receiver was in Alberta. You don't always get Canada, uh, California when you're in Alberta with a cheap antenna. So we didn't always get coverage in those times. In general, it's pretty good coverage. This will not happen with Olchi. It's all completely covered. It's really cool, actually. Olchi, they actually recorded on the orbit, and they downloaded in uh, Norway, Karina, Norway. 
on every orbit. So they will get the whole world, or every orbit, they get one shot. They get like 20 orbits to do the world. And they go over Carina, they download it all. So it's really amazing setup to do that, how that works. But it will be captured, all of it. But key thing here, there's your bloom season. This is in the summer of 2009. It reduced bloom season 2010 overall. So we have the timing of the bloom, the severity of the bloom, so forth. The CIs here, these are scaled. They can all be converted, converted to uh, chlorophyll concentrations overall. And the, you can see the, uh, the conditions for uh, May and August of 2009, which put us right about in here as the bloom goes through. So that's an example of time series. The entire data set will go back to 2002. So this kind of information can be brought out. Oh, and these were off the, uh, uh, these are the 10, by the way, these are the 10-day uh, composites, I should say. These are not dailies, sorry. That's an important point. This is not daily seen. These are the 10-day composites. These are extracted from the 10-day composites. The 10-day composites are part of the product we're providing. So that's literally the composite conditions for each 10-day period. And the idea is to eliminate all those problems. Instead of you go along and you had one useful scene, nothing, 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 10 days, 10 days. So over certain periods of time, 10 days, there were no retrievals. But these are 10 days. That's why it's actually as continuous as it is. Um, you can do um, dailies and do that kind of extraction. But that's the basic information content. Um, I'm not sure what we had. These are original tiles, which I'm sorry to say I didn't remove here because their tiles actually include the entire California, the first image you saw on the map. Um, now, I should note, uh, just to repeat on resolution, I hear a lot. I, I seem to be asked about Pinto Lake regularly. Um, anyone here are interested in Pinto Lake? Okay. I'm sorry, we can't do Pinto Lake with Mara. Um, and it's just not, it's not large enough. Um, sometimes we can see some other interesting blooms. We happen to pick up another major bloom, uh, have in the, I think it's probably Cochlodinium bloom in Monterey Bay at this time. Um, this is just CI. We didn't separate into two non-cyanos, but Pencil Lake is not resolvable. The Klamath, there's clearly an interest in that area. Um, and these two, Iron Gate and Copco, are, are a good question on, we looked at the question of how well can we do it? We can't see Pencil Lake. So here's the um, true color image, and this is zoomed in on the data for these two lakes. So where you see the colors in these two are valid retrieve pixels. The white line is, of course, is the polygon we got from um, it's the state polygon. So we can take up all information, but these are valid pixels. The brown, the dark brown are areas that we're examining in case they might be usable data. And we extracted the polygons from both of these, and what we found is if we average these up at a monthly scale, you can identify the blooms in these small areas. The individual scenes kind of come and go. And so what we have at the top here, this is, this is monthly from 2009 through 2010 for both reservoirs. This is actual, we've got this out of report, so it's a little messy. And you can see these three bloom events showing up. These are like only a single station in each reservoir, but we're clearly picking those up um, for the intensity based on the monthly data. The monthly data is one of the products we're also providing here. And there's two ways we're actually presenting that. So the 10 day composites are part of this, the dailies, the 10 day composite, and the monthlies are available. We believe for these really, these very narrow reservoirs, the monthlies will get the most information, but you're more than welcome to, to, to beat on any of the other data as you would like to as well. But these, um, and these concentrations would be consistent. If we converted this back into chlorophyll, they would be consistent with the chlorophylls of, uh, this is about 30 micrograms per liter um, concentration. But that is the time series going on through that time. Um, some data like Elsinore, anyone from, okay. Um, 
those who in the southern state right here, visible. Um, this is data actually out of that. Got quite a eutrophic lake there. Uh, lots of stuff going in it too, different kinds of things. And example time series, this um, this is cyano. The top one is actually cyano, and um, this is the total chlorophyll. And when there was a bloom right here, we're flagging it correctly as cyano. When they said there wasn't, meaning it was probably diatoms or green, were not identified as a cyano bloom. So all the bloom is in the um, other organisms. And these are standard total chlorophyll, the cyanochlorophyll, and cyanophyll. they're all separated out. And if you take the two together, they're yes, no, so they will always add up exactly to the same. It's either one or the other, the separation. But that particular event, as identified as a bloom, clearly was identified as cyanos in our processing in this particular data set. So we're confident that we're picking up most of these blooms pretty well. And these, by the way, these colors, were, these are up at easily the same concentration. We would estimate chlorophylls at 50 to 100 micrograms based on these kind of numbers, which is about what the, um, the values are for that particular time period. And Clear Lake, of course, quite visible. We've shown examples before. The same data set that you had seen earlier um, showing the development of uh, the bloom over time and the diminishing of that bloom over time. And the same, just to re reiterate this, that the patterns that you can get as possible with the dailies to get a timing of the blooms as well. So you can think in terms of a monitoring strategy as well. So that um, going into the future. So those would be the pieces. Last area of interest, uh, the delta. Uh, quite interesting in the sense that it's narrow. It's just like narrow reservoirs. Um, and this is the processing. Uh, at this particular time, you can see the uh, getting the information. We're getting some indications of blooms in these areas. Um, any of these darker color are areas that um, do not pass as pure water. They are mixed pixels. And some of these are quite narrow, but I think we've got an example go through. There are some chlorophyll blooms. Cyanos were kind of low. And you can see that most of the area shows nothing, but Frank's tract here starts to get a bloom during this time based on our analysis and the reports out from um, the water quality report are if there was a sign of bloom present during that particular time. So this is this is the anything that's black in this area would not have had a sign of bloom at this particular time. And the colors do. That's the information content and the daily data. Now, as far as the total time series from 2002 to 12, this is <clears throat> the amount of seeds potentially available across California. What we call partial coverage means some part of the state is covered. Um, and full coverage is it's pretty much covering uh, the whole state or uh, one way or the other is being covered there. You can see that um, basically 2008 and beyond, it's um, full coverage at least 10 times a month and partial coverage 15 to 20 times a month. And then before that, when it was recorded, it's less frequent. But in all the cases, there are several scenes every month for, for the area. There will be reasonable coverage overall. 2002 was clearly the thinnest because they just it was long, it became operational in April 2002. You don't have everything figured out completely in the first few months, but there's an excellent uh, data set to work with overall. Um, now, last bit here. What are we doing? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. We have to get out. Of right. Right. Okay. Uh, higher resolution sensors. Uh, probably the two most important on this are Sentinel-2 and Landsat. Sentinel-2 is the European Space Agency's equivalent to Landsat. The first one is supposed to be launched next month. Launch date is the 12th or 13th or something. Um, it has an extra band that Landsat doesn't have that will help with biomass. Neither one of these, though, can specifically identify cyanobacteria. Um, they can identify, um, 
but Sentinel-2 has a band that will work pretty well for chlorophyll biomass. It has some sediment sensitivities, which I can explain to someone at a later time with the algorithm, but it's uh, much improved. Um, Landsat um, is certainly good for eutrophication, and um, there was an excellent work done by uh, Oregon on uh, carbon and environmental quality that showed that in some of those lakes in interior Oregon that they could do a pretty good job of getting chlorophyll out of that. This will vary a lot, and I can say you're not going to have a one-size-fits-all with Landsat, but I think eutrophication will work. USGS is involved in the science project in spite of what I said earlier. Um, they are involved. They're one of the partners. They run Landsat. I don't know if you know that. Landsat program belongs to USGS. And they're also really interested in Sentinel-2 because that complements Landsat. What they would like to see is a water quality metric that they could apply nationally. And so we're going to be working on that with Landsat data. And if we get that to work, Landsat 5 goes back to 1984. So if we come up any eutrophication index we come up with that they can apply will be available for all that Landsat data. And that's the goal, to do that. The Sentinel-2 is potentially in the future. One exciting thing on that is they're planning a next launch, and so they'll be down to from 10-day repeat um, for Sentinel-2A to 5-day repeat with two satellites. These are 30, 20-meter bands. And so there's a potential in a few years that there'll be more information for some of the small lakes. If we get Landsat to produce a product that is at least reasonably compatible, then um, there is a real powerful monitoring tool combining this together. But I should emphasize, Landsat does not have um, quite the same spectral information, but we're, we're going to push it um, on, on there. Um, some of the lakes, it will work really well in California, and some it won't. And I can't emphasize that enough, that that's We'll have places where it works spectacularly well. The Oregon work, at those lakes, it worked great, but there are places I know in Ohio that if I apply the same algorithm, I'm not going to get the same vessel. But there is, we're working on that, and we expect in a couple of years we will have it, so it's a systematic process. And important on that is we get anything <laughs> systematic means you get a product that you can use. Well, maybe say it's trophic state or water clarity or something. But you can use it there. You don't have to figure out, you don't have to do, you don't have to go back and refresh your calculus. You don't have to learn atmospheric correction. That's the whole point out of this, is that the products are delivered in the most useful form. So, um, so we'll stay tuned. Any higher resolution or commercial, if you've got lots of money to buy Worldview 2, um, you can do something there. But personally, I would go after the drones and cameras if you're looking for that kind of thing. You've to do it a lot cheaper. And these are the various non-commercial ones. I think that summarizes this, because the presentation will be available. This kind of captures the time frame, the resolution, way more than you want to look at now. Um, so um, where we are with this, we can find the high chlorophyll cyanoblooms in the lakes. Um, by the way, with these blooms, when you get down to below about 10 micrograms per liter, we can't see the cyano with those for good. Well, I think this is the last slide or the next one. Um, but in those cases, it's rare that that's a problem from a biomass perspective or a toxin perspective. Um, and in many of your lakes, I think if you've got below 10 micrograms, you might be happy. 10 micrograms per liter chlorophyll, that would be a really good day. So that's not a problem. Um, Excellent coverage in when you look at the time series from 2009 into 2012. It'll be thinner, but it's all it'll all be available before then. Um, of course, we can't see the smallest lakes, and we are and there's a separation of cyanos and other blooms. In the future, the intent is again for we will be processing ulchi that'll be made available in the same form. So uh, everything that the GIS people are working with, the same methods, it'll like we can apply directly to the ulchi data. That's the whole. That's the whole goal here. That this is not going to be okay. You've now got a Maris data set, so you're on your own, and you have to hire a remote sensor and buy expensive systems. No, the idea is it's the same thing. That's that's what we'll be working at through this and the Cyan project. And overall, our evaluations, the time series. Um, it's the whole state of California. 
We're using the, the Maris data to capture this and uh, allows you to do all these things that you want to do. Um, so we will have specific evaluation. We've done some evaluations of some of the lights. We'll just refine those, and then, then the rest is it'll be your opportunity. We will be looking for feedback from, from environmental managers and GS people on the products and, and what they're getting out of them. I think that's it. And we have about three minutes for any questions. Is this type of data available um, or is it centered on the US? Merit data is, there is Merit data for the whole world. Um, if you want the process data, if you want to process Merit data, yes, you can get it for wherever it's available. Um, you can go to the European Space Agency to do that. I think NASA only got it for the US, I think the NASA site. But it's, that would require you to process the data. Um, one, a Andrew, how big is one Merit swath at 300 meters? About 500 megs, and it takes about how long to process it on our 16 processor CPU system? 45 minutes, right? It's available and it's not available. There's a catch-22. Okay. Do you have a sense if the how many lakes? What's the number of lakes we need to look at? The question is how many lakes in California can be evaluated and we looked at, and I don't have an answer. Thomas Mike, we, we, we took the state um, data set, we crunched it against ours, we eliminated the absolute smallest lakes that we knew we didn't have a chance, and there's some number, which Thomas could answer, SFDI could answer that. Yeah, so right now it's, it's around 170 lakes. Oh, it's about 170 lakes that can be picked up in California as right now with this resolution. So, but we have we there's a included on for the jazz people. There is a a, a, a shape file that has those a, a draft one. It's being refined, but there is a draft one, so you can look and see which lakes. Should go. Important thing is, by the way, this data is provided as imagery. So it's raster, for those who know this, raster data. So our only exclusion was lakes that absolutely we couldn't pick up, like Pinto Lake. It just, we knew it would be impossible. It's one pixel, it's two pixels, it's three pixels. The rest, it's there. And so you might have a lake that might get one pixel retrievable, but we've tried to remove all of those defects. So if, if you can get something out of it, it should be useful. So just want to thank Rick very much. I'm going to ask you, because the room is reserved for a 1 o'clock function, if you want to um, ask more questions, if you could step out into the box and talk. Folks who are staying for the afternoon training, if you could also gather out in the lobby. I'll be out there in about 10 minutes, and we can um, do what we need to for the afternoon. Um, and again, Rick, thank you very much for coming and giving this. And I want to again remind folks that June 17th, there's going to be another webinar with Amber, who is the EPA project. And again, June 29th is the Science Collaborators Met Conference Call. Thanks again.